Hello, so with this recording, I'd like to introduce the topic of flavor symmetry. What do we mean by that? So when the neutron was discovered, it was noted that the mass of the neutron is very close to the mass of the proton. And so it seems like those two particles are somehow related, even so the electric charge is different. The proton is charged, the neutron is neutral. And you can see here that the masses are really very, very close about one MeV or 1% different in mass. So Heisenberg proposed, and that was in the 1930s, to regard them as two states of the same particle. They were really so different that you could, you know, think that they are basically the same, just, you know, a rotation from one into the other. And that's exactly what he did. Um, considering them as one particle, a nucleon, nucleon um, where the proton, you know, is, um, described as a duplet with, you know, an, an up duplet and the neutron as a down duplet, similar to, you know, an up quark and a down quark, an electron and a neutrino later on. Those particles were not known at the time. So he introduces a new concept, so-called isospin, or strong isospin, where he's doing exactly this. He labels the proton up and he labels the neutron down. So, so far we haven't done anything, but you know, introduced new labels for new part for, for particles, new particles at the time. But now if you assume that the strong force is invariant under rotations in this isospin space, meaning, you know, when you flip the neutron into a proton and vice versa, those rotations are invariant, uh, the strong force is invariant under those rotations. Um, that means, or what follows directly, is that the isospin is conserved in all strong interactions. So that is what really the, the conclusion is of this introduction of those new labels, is that isospin is conserved under strong interactions. So this was proposed in the 1930s. Again, you know, we noticed the sy symmetry in nature, and from that symmetry, a conservation law um, follows. Even so, and we can conclude, uh, you know, physics, um, cross-sections or ratios of cross-sections from it, without understanding, in this case, QCD, the strong interaction. So this is quasi fascin very fascinating, and you can just apply this concept now to other particles, for example, the pion. The pion has an isospin of one, and there are three pions, or three states, um, the, the zero state, the up state, and the down state, which is the pi plus, the pi zero, and the pi minus. Um, in general, you can conclude that the multiplicity of your particles, um, you know, as you see the neutron, the proton, the pi plus, the pi zero, and the pi minus, um, the multiplicity is two times the isospin plus one. Isospin equal one means that there are three particles uh, as, as part of the representation. So far, so good. Um, so later, um, you know, this this concept was you know, uh, moved to other new particles. Many new particles were introduced and produced in the emergent accelerators and experiments on the market. And people try to classify them in those, um, by, their, by their isospin. Um, Gelman and Nishiyama um, empirically observed that there is a relation which holds this equation here which is that the charge, if you uh, assign the maximum value I3, um, the third component of your isospin, to the member of the multiplet with the highest charge, you know, in the previous example it was either the proton or the pi plus, then the charge of this particle follows from the isospin, the baryon number and the strangeness. Uh, we looked at baryon number and strangeness before, there's a reminder, strangeness is the number of strange quarks in, in the the baryon or the meson, and the baryon number is simply the, the number of baryons. So if you just look at this, as, for example, for this pion case, we had the isospin equal one, baryon number equal zero, strange is equal zero, which follows that the maximum charge involved is one, which is the charge of the positively charged pion. So far, so good. This, this was empirically observed, but once you then later discover and develop a quark model, this is then in the 1970s, um, 
you can deduce this equation directly from the assignment of isospin to quarks, which is rather fascinating. Again, we don't understand the physics fully, but just from the symmetry you can, and empirically you can deduce um, information about physical systems. However, if you try to now extend this idea of isospin to a complete to the complete quark model, you, fi you find that the symmetry starts to be broken. It already starts to be broken slightly when you in include strangeness or strange quarks, but it's badly broken when you include charm, bottom, or top. And the reason can be seen here. The up quark and the down quark, both of the particles making up ions and uh, the neutron and the proton. And even if you include strangeness, the difference in mass is not very large. So, you know, the symmetry, the particles, you know, really look like they're the same particle in a different state of the same particle. While when you introduce other quarks, heavier quarks, charm on bottom, you find that um, the mass difference is so large that the symmetries are broken. So this concept starts failing because of the large mass differences because the symmetry is broken. All right, so from here, we now go to discrete symmetries. Um, and again, from the observ observ observation of those symmetries, we can deduce physics without fully understanding the underlying physics. 